Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest. Vicky, I was talking to you directly. You don't have to wait. Jesus. Anyway, so this is Bob Coppage, uh, CEO, Grand Pooba, Simplex IT, another episode of BizTech Twists. And I have a a, a guest uh, this episode who likes to wave for no particularly good reason. And that's Vicky Bruns, who is the manager for Marketplace and Vendor Solutions over at ConnectWise. And Vicky, first of all, thanks for losing the bet that got you here. I appreciate that. And and what actually, uh, outside of just whatever they can get you to do, what actually yeah. is manager of Marketplace and Vendor Solutions? Okay. Well, I can I wave now? Can you I can wave. Yeah. And, and the thing hey. is, apparently, from what I've been told, most people listen to podcasts. They don't actually watch them. So okay. Okay. Well, well most people have no idea what I'm talking about. If you can, if you can picture it, I'm I'm waving I'm waving uh, in the video now at back at Bob and anybody anybody else who's actually watching uh, this podcast recording. Uh, so that's a wonderful question, Bob. First of all, thank you for allowing me to come onto your podcast, and I'm super excited to talk to you today about all the things that we're going to discuss. I I don't want to tease the audience too much with no. what we're going to get into, but I've I've been at ConnectWise for in dog years, it's been a long time, almost <laughs> nine years <laughs> at ConnectWise. And I've I've loved it. I started out in sales at ConnectWise. I was on the sales team for three years and then moved over to our ecosystem team, which is where I am, a manager uh, and also a, a an ecosystem leader for our marketplace and for vendor solutions. So we have a bunch of different levels of vendor engagements and partnerships at ConnectWise. And some of those you may be familiar with and maybe the audience is familiar with or not, but it's essentially a, an integration program that where we partner with vendors, software vendors, mm-hmm. and we educate them on how to make the most of an integration experience into our platform, which as a, a managed service provider, this is a set of solutions at ConnectWise that we own that managed service providers utilize every day. And when you're talking about managing a solution stack of, I don't know, Bob, you tell me how many different solutions are you using to run your business today? 4,723. That's a lot. Oh, 24. We just signed up another one. (laughs) Right. So it it gets to be a lot. And the more that you can have that dual sync of information back and forth between all the solutions that different People on your team, depending on what they do, can can utilize and make them more efficient in their jobs and helping your clients. That's really what we do. We want to set our managed service providers, our our clients up for success as a vendor and also working with other vendors to show them the way, show them the path. It's like um, (laughs) I used to play video games a lot when I was a kid and I always wanted to get those little cheat books. Right. Like right. here's my here's my cheat book of how do I how do I beat Legend of Zelda? I played that game back and forth a million times. And um that's basically what ConnectWise does. We we're like the cheat book for vendors on how to create that integration experience. Okay, so here's the thing, and this is what we discussed beforehand. A lot of people who are gonna be listening to this show are not necessarily managed service providers or right. So to them, a they don't care about 90% of what you just said, although it was it's still great and all that. But spoiler alert for them, a lot of what we're going to talk about has nothing to do with specifically MSP or the like, but it does have to do with some of the things. So, so full disclosure, uh, Simplex IT, we're a managed service provider. So we provide great IT uh, performance and, and results for our clients, uh, both through managing and co-managing their IT resources, sometimes yep. with IT. So there is your, your vendor-client relationship. But then we have vendor-client relationships with third parties, such as ConnectWise, yes. who create a lot of the, the synergy and a lot of the tools and the integration. Because at the end of the day, and I've got 20 people here, we can't develop all of these tools, these resources, and, and rarely most companies don't. Uh, so they have to rely on partners, such as in our case, ConnectWise. And in cases of uh, a widget manufacturer, they have the companies that make their raw materials that they exactly. use. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And you and I have talked because we've worked together uh, with CompTIA uh, committees and all that kind of fun stuff. And 
part of the challenge that that you and I both talk about in the industry, and again, you're the vendor, I'm the client in this situation, but is this concept of ecosphere and, and this concept of, of that environment that we work in with whatever business relationship we have. And especially when you're, from your perspective, uh, you know, marketplace, vendor solutions, all of that, uh, but also all the integration of all the products, uh, it's a perspective that we don't pay enough attention to. And, and it, it, it sounds, it sounds new age. Right? <laughs> it does. Yeah. It's ecosphere. A great, ecosystem is a great buzzword. <laughs> okay. So what, what is ecosystem? I was calling it ecosphere ecosystem. So what, what is an ecosystem? Why does that matter? I, I think the general concept of an ecosystem is have it, you have a platform and you've got whatever that platform may be, and it's connected to producers and consumers in a way that is cyclical. But, I mean, it's it's like you have a widget and somebody is utilizing that widget through some type of platform connection. And, you know, but then when you think about all the other different widgets out there and you're thinking of, you know, the people that you're selling to at the end of the day, um, creating a healthy ecosystem in my mind is trying to find those widgets or those partnerships that provide the most value to your clients at the end of the day. And it's a reciprocal process and it's, and it, and it evolves over time based on the needs of the business. So that's, that's kind of the way I think about it. I don't know. What about you, Bob? What are your, what well, and, and your... this is the thing. And, and I don't know. And, and what I mean by, I don't mean that in a negative, in a negative way or the like, Yeah. but it is so relationship driven. It is. You yes. know, where is so much of our businesses back in the day before Zelda, you know, <laughs> the legend of Zelda so yes. before the legend of Zelda. <laughs> Uh, you know, was there a day where it was just Zelda? Zelda really hadn't become a legend, or anyway. But back then, we were so much more on the transactional level. Yes, that we were out for the best price, and a lot of people still are or the like. But but it has become so relationship driven that we have to be concerned about what are our clients doing, what are our vendors doing, what are all that kind of good stuff. Uh. Yeah. And we we have to, then you get into the, am I going to have to nurture it? Am I going to have to review it? Is it going to change? And the answer to those are always yes. Yeah. And there's a, there's a connection between what your audience is doing and their end clients and between you and I, you as a managed service right. provider and me as a vendor. And if something happens along that supply chain, it can impact all the way down to the the employee of of one of your clients right like it's an individual employee that's all the way down the line um or maybe the end consumer right at that point and so that's why from a um from like a i guess a system standpoint it's it, it's all interconnected and and that's why building a healthy channel or a healthy ecosystem is so valuable. Um, and when you're looking for partnerships with a managed service provider like yourself, you're looking for somebody who's going to not just sell you something and then walk away. You're looking for a partnership. Right. Um, that's a reciprocal partnership. And I think that's one of the things that is slowly becoming one of the lessons out of uh, the pandemic, the work from anywhere and the like, is that literally you have people who grew up on just-in-time purchasing, mm -hmm. just-in-time inventories, just-in-time purchasing, especially on the manufacturing side, uh, because you don't want large inventories. You don't want large bottles. Right. You don't want these services or goods that you don't really need, but you might down the road, blah, blah, blah. And so we wanted to be as lean as possible. And then suddenly everything changed on the supply chain side. And now we found out, ooh, that's not so great. Uh, and, and a lot of companies ended up with, with all sorts of problems and situations. And the ones that I think did the best were the ones that had the relationships in place so they could go to their providers, whether it be the vendors, they could go to their clients and they could say, Hey, this is going on. 
let's work together to solve this issue. And similarly, because I, I remember with the work from work from anywhere being almost overnight thrown yes. to us, we had to work with our clients who suddenly said, hey, we can't bring our employees in. What can we do to make it? Because their customers wanted their goods and services still delivered. Right. With no downtime. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So they're, so you literally had the their clients come, going to them saying, hey, we still expect your goods and services to be delivered yep. while their employees are working from anywhere. So those clients, our clients were then going and doing work from anywhere, asking us who were doing a work from anywhere. So we went to our vendor partners, such as uh, ConnectWise, and we all had to work together. To make it happen. And to make it happen. Yeah. And and those of us who had, I think, relationships versus transactions mm-hmm. up and down the board, it was much easier for us to because we understood what the ecosystems were doing. We understood we could ask questions that were not automatically assumed to be, you're trying to sell me something. Yeah. Well, and it wasn't just the selling aspect. It was the educational component, too, yeah. of these partnerships and I remember when Zoom um, just took off. You remember the stock price? Like just the, oh, yeah. it, it just, it went through the roof. And I I myself got a Zoom account when that was happening because I still wanted to see my friends and, and family. And um, and then nobody nobody was using the passcodes. Do you remember that? When people oh, yeah, pop people into other Zoom, Zoom calls yeah. and stuff. I, I just, it was, it was just, Amazing and such a Herculean feat, and I feel like for managed service providers out there to, and for your clients to have to figure out how to navigate those hurdles. Yeah, that was those were interesting times. (laughs) That term, (laughs) absolutely. But it was something that reinforced that we had to have those relationships. Yes, Mm -hmm. and those relationships had to be both both firm and strong in terms of, of they could survive challenges and the like, but they also had to be flexible so that an organization can say, I can rely on my provider, my vendor to help me through this. And I'm going to be reliable with my client to help me through this. And in order for that to happen though, we have to have that now is, you know, one of my favorite sayings is, is uh, the worst time to learn CPR is when someone's having a heart attack. Yeah. You know, similarly, the worst time to develop this relationship is when you really need the relationship to, to work. Mm-hmm. You know, so from your perspective, what's the what's the best way to build or maintain that relationship when you're talking about client vendor? And I'll either role, either as a client or the vendor. I think consistency. And, and having having a plan that you're working in a collaborative way together is so important. There are a lot of times when we're working with our clients, our partners, which are managed service providers, and then also working with other software vendors where we're striking these partnerships. And you have to have a set of expectations up front. Okay, what's the goal? What what are we trying to accomplish here together? What are we trying to do? And 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 let's make sure it's obviously there's revenue targets and everything that we all have, our safety targets, right? Um, there's all these pieces that go into that plan, but there's the 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 execution of that plan and the follow through of, of that plan, which is so important as well. And um, it sounds super easy, but it's it's not if you do it right you have to you have to really dedicate your your time and those efforts to the partnership to make sure that it's it's profitable and it's also um i guess pr- productive for both sides of the equation and and that's that's definitely something especially from uh, you know we're a vendor that works with hundreds of other vendors and and thousands of managed service providers and so trying to find a way to to scale that value right it, it's it's really it, it can be challenging but it's also again it goes back to what is that what is that goal what is that um for this partnership what are we looking to do what are we looking to accomplish and let's break it down because when you get into a reactive state like you mentioned 
when the pandemic hit and and you were administering CPR without knowing how to perform CPR, maybe with some clients, then it's like, man, if we if we had gone through the steps of of creating this plan together at the beginning, um, and again, nobody could predict that this pandemic was going to happen, right? So I know it's kind of like, you know, um, what do they say? Like um, hindsight's twenty twenty. Yep. Yeah. So, but I mean, now I think we've all kind of learned a lesson from that, a business lesson, and that there are opportunities to become more proactive as a business, right? Working with other businesses to say, what are those targets? What are we going to do? If something happens, what's going to be the emergency plan? Um, so those are my two cents. And and I wasn't listening for most of that, but <laughs> no, I, I was. It is good. But one thing I, I do want to hit on is the term value. Uh, and the reason I, I do is because I think that's a word that became very different uh, because of because of the last couple of years. I think to a certain degree, the word value was kind of uh, throw, bandered around with any, without a lot of definition as to what that was, or we strictly use value as profit. That's it. It's the money we made. It's the whatever. But I think that that between all of the things that have happened over the past, both economic as, as well as the health and, and just personal experiences that we've had, I think yeah. value is now uh, we need to pay a little more attention to what we consider individually and as organizations value. So one of the things that I, I like to do with clients is to basically say, look, you have to define what the value of this relationship is. What yeah. is it the thing? What is it that makes your organization, yourself, whatever, more successful, more whatever positive adjective you want to use? And then I have to do the same from the relationship because I can't, I can't define your value for you. And you can't define, you know, my value. Or, or the like. Uh, and I think, I think it's we, also articulating. You have to be able to articulate yeah. artic articulate your value as a managed service provider too, because I I used to be a business banker before I got into technology and, and I worked with a lot of, of small businesses that were local. And yeah, I mean, I think that there's obviously some that are more technically proficient than others, hmm. but what is that value that you're, that you're bringing? Not in the widgets, but in the services that you offer that are going to help ultimately help them to run their business. Yeah. And especially right. if, if, if whoever the provider is and whoever the consumer is of the service, if either one of them strictly talks about me, 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 me. So as managed service providers, and, and honestly, this is something our industry is not the best at. Uh, a lot of us, our marketing method is let me tell you how cool we are. Right. Let me tell you how fantastic we are. Let me tell you, let me throw about 20 buzzwords in a, in a single paragraph about all these things that we do that have nothing directly to do with, with the you. value. Yeah, <laughs> with, with the widgets or with, with whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's a challenge because especially if you're trying to create that that ecosystem, that, that environment there, uh, if all you do is talk about yourself, that's not going to go well. No, it's, it's, I mean, the same can be said for, for vendors all the way up the supply chain or yeah. manufacturers. You have to, you have to really understand how to not, how you can't go, you can't launch into features and benefits. You have to understand the why of what your client is trying to accomplish. And um, I think one of the things that I've been learning a lot since I've been in the channel is we've got, we've got a lot of great thought leaders in, in our, in our space that talk to other managed service providers and say, when you're providing that value, what are things that, that companies could look at as a benefit that maybe weren't typically part of um, offerings in the past? So there's this concept of everything as a service that it's, it's not just the, you know, Bob, you were telling me earlier about, um, you know, kind of like the the beginning when you became a managed service provider, it's changed a lot over the years. And there's been an evolution as there's been an evolution with technology you, and you cyber go, security. You, you can go ahead and say I'm old. It's, no, it's I'm not. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I was and not going to say woman. that. <laughs> but it's, it's, 
there's so much happening and it's happening at such a faster clip than it ever has before in our lifetimes. Yep. And trying to figure out how to disseminate all of that information that's being thrown at you as a managed service provider and then articulating it in a way that makes sense to your clients. I mean, that is that is a skill that is an art and that is something that you have to learn because again, you're talking to business owners, you're not talking about widgets, you're talking about how if something happens with this widget, right? Then what is the business impact of that? Right. And how can I help you to, to proactively, um, obviously not make that happen? <laughs> um, or if it does happen, what is the backup plan? What is the disaster recovery plan? And I do think that that's actually one of the things that we don't do enough of. And I, I think this is true across the board. Uh, is to ask the question, what if? And that what if question can be one of what if this opportunity prevent, presents itself? What if this uh, calamity presents itself or this mm -hmm. vulnerability or the whatever? And we we are so fixated on the, it, it's going to go great. It's going to go fantastic. We all want it to go great. Absolutely. I don't. Right? I love, I'd love to see it just go up in flames. <laughs> <laughs> but as long as I'm not part of it, but no, it, but, but it's, you're right. We, we all want to see success. We all want, want to see that the happy ending and all that kind of fun stuff. But the bottom line is none of us are in a risk-free world and none of That's us true. are in a world that is going to be the same tomorrow, let alone, yeah. let alone six months, a year from now or whatever. And everything. And uh, there's a, a, author and uh, uh, former professional poker player named Annie Duke. So I've, I, I've talked about her so much. She's probably going to get a police order out on me, uh, <laughs> but she basically put out a, where her first book was called thinking in bets, where she talks about the, the, the strategy game for business. Everybody thinks it's chess. It shouldn't be, it should be poker because in chess, you know, the rules, you know, the moves, you know, the opponent, there's only one end of the game that is good. And life is never like that. No, it's always, always, always it. The, you gotta, it's all probabilities. You could play the most logical hand you could, and you'll still lose and vice versa. And there's so many situations where we make mistakes but we played it right, but it ends up, I, I shouldn't say we make mistakes. We didn't. We played the odds as we understood them in that situation. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it doesn't go well uh, because something that was the odds of work wasn't going to happen, but it did happen. And this is where, again, the relationships that you've already got in place, the discussions that you've already got in place, the goodwill that you've built up, the conversations you've already had will come in and as often as not save the day. Yes, absolutely. I was I was going to say too, one of the things that uh, when you were talking through that scenario, I was thinking about how in the software world, whenever you see something advertised as working 100% of the time, that is a complete a complete farce. Nothing works a hundred percent of the time yeah. for forever. That's just that's just the real world. And um, and yeah, I mean, but when something doesn't go as planned and there is a, there is something that happens, you have to do the postmortems too. You have to understand, okay, let's reverse engineer it. What happened and what can we do to learn from this experience together and and make it better the next time around? Yeah. And so yeah, I mean, finding a good partnership, no matter where you are, again, in the channel, if you are a vendor, you're a manufacturer, you're a managed service provider, you are a small business owner that's leveraging managed service provider, you make sure you document that incident, and then you learn from it together, and you make it better. Okay, it sounds to me like we're looking for a way to document whose fault it is and whose butt we can can. And I <laughs> want to talk about that more, but we're first going to take a break uh, so I can come up with some good stuff to say. We'll be Let's right back. Yeah. Sometimes the most effective IT support model for organizations is a combination of internal IT employees along with an MSP partner that's experienced in co-managed IT services. Consider Simplex IT. We work in partnership with your existing IT team, providing the support and resources for your organization to excel. 
Plus, our CEO, Bob Coppage, is the recognized industry expert in co-managed IT services and has authored the only two books on the topic. That's me. Visit simplex-it.com and look under services to learn more. And we're back and uh, back with Vicki Bruns over at uh, ConnectWise. And we were talking about how we were going to use kind of an incident response process, which, of course, is, is very popular for cybersecurity. Um, I wanted to use it so that we could find people to blame because blame is fun. Uh, but you don't seem to think that blame is necessarily a great maybe, thing. Maybe accountability. Maybe that's a better a better word. <laughs> I'm using fewer letters, and fewer <laughs> letters is more easily understandable. Okay, all right. That's no, fair. but accountability, <laughs> and, and that is part part of the challenge. Uh, and and that's why actually one of the nice things that cybersecurity has done is they've forced us to do a lot of a lot more incident response, uh, where we take a look at what happened because we have to from a security standpoint. Because if the bad yeah. guys got in once through a vulnerability, they're going to try again for the same vulnerability. Uh, I would think, too, from an insurance claim perspective, absolutely. that having that documentation is key. Absolutely. Well. But how do we do this whole thing? And, is, and and let's talk about it from an ecosystem standpoint. Uh, how do we do that from a we're not looking to create blame? Or, or maybe you. we are, but, but accountability we are. And what's the I difference think, there? <laughs> I think it goes back to what we were talking about before of setting the stage at the beginning of a partnership, you have to set the right expectations right. and and you have to, to make sure that everybody understands what their roles and responsibilities are in this, in this partnership. And again, I, I think that there are obviously the best of intentions, a lot of excitement when, when there's a, a new partnership at play. But it's almost like, um, you know, when you have the contract, when you write the contract, it's you're not hoping for an, a divorce. Um, but if something happens or, my, my if, something, wife may differ. or, the, or if there's a bump along the way, you've got you've got your business plan in place. You've got something in place that you can go back and reference when when something when an incident occurs. Right. And, and so I think that. If you can utilize that business plan and that 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 accountability in a way and set the stage in the beginning to say, look, we're not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but we want to make sure that everybody really understands what their roles are in this partnership. So so that way um, we're making the most of it and we'll learn, we'll learn. Yep. But if you don't set those up, if you don't define those in the beginning on either side of the fence, then boy, it can get really muddy really quick. Absolutely. The, the example I would always love is, is that a company didn't want people breaking into their office. So they bought this really, really expensive, tremendously secure door. And the company, the, the managed service provider, then uh, installed the door, but didn't really set it up to be monitored uh, as well as you thought. And then the client actually installed it, putting a cinder block to hold the door open because it was really a pain in the butt to uh, unlock the door all the time. So you have all three parties who are looking at, and the final party, the, the client is looking at, I want productivity to be high. Yeah, you know, I want this, th that, and the other thing. But all three parties to a certain degree are going to look and basically say, I thought you were I thought you were. I, going, I thought you were taking care of that. Exactly. And then it's well, and then it's like this. Everybody's you got it. pointing fingers the other way. Absolutely. And and, yeah. and the challenge on that is ab we have that whole because lawyers get involved and you you brought up insurance insurance companies get involved all that kind of fun stuff. So the accountability can have significant financial repercussions, uh, but by the same token, it has to be done. And, and again, I'll get back to that whole relationships make this possible. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the relationship is you basically say you have to do this or else you are going to be held liable. I'm not trying to blame you. I'm not trying to for I'm, but I'm just trying to tell you how it is and communicate that uh, as opposed to it's your problem. You know, and, and I think that's that's one of the where, again, if it's transactional, hey, we installed it. You know, and we gave we we. Wipe your hands clean and walk away. And well, no, I also I also sent three YouTube video links. <laughs> yeah, you know. Well, but in a transactional relationship, you would just wipe your hands clean and you'd walk away. But yeah. in a true partnership, you're you're checking in. You've installed the door. You're following back up. Hey, yeah. how's the door working for you? Does anybody have any questions about how to how to if it's a keyed door? Yeah. Use their key to swipe in. 
Is anybody using a cinder block? I saw that there was a there was a time when the door was open for, for like an hour. But, but Just, that's part of it. That's part of it. Is is that yeah. whole is, is you don't want to go back to the client and say, "Boy, you're a dummy. You're not using this properly." Right. You know, the like, but to go back and say, "Hey, I noticed that." I, you know, when I was I was there the other day, uh, I noticed there was a cinder block. You know, that's making it slightly easier for bad guys to get in. You know, I'm not a criminal mastermind, but I'm pretty sure a propped open door is easier to get into than a closed locked one. Yes. I, I, I watch Law and Order a lot. I'm not going to bother myself with Legend of Zelda, but you know, which by the way, <laughs> hey, that was a great game. I that did play Legend game. of Zelda a fair amount when I was. When oh, I was, you did? When okay, I was, okay. I loved it. I I used to play in this barber chair that my father bought for seventy five cents at an antique shop. And he later told me this horrible story. I spent my whole childhood literally sitting in this chair, in this barbershop chair, uh, playing Super Mario or, uh, you know, playing playing Legend of Zelda. And I found out the story behind it and why it was so cheap when he bought it at the antique shop. It's because there was a guy that was getting a, a shave done and he had one of those towels wrapped around yeah. his face when he was um, sitting back in the barber chair. And another guy came into the barber shop and actually killed him because if there was an affair going on and and yeah, there were nefarious things going on. And so he killed the other guy. And now we've got a haunted barber chair that I sat in for most of my childhood. It's great. I no longer have to ask questions about how why you are the way you are. <laughs> It makes a lot more sense now. It really it? does. Yeah. Are, which is part of the whole professional relationship standpoint. Right. It's the right. more you understand about the cultural story of the organizations, the more you can make sure they're in sync. You, you, you see how I just. I, went I right love there. how you just made that connection. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Because. But yeah. I'm afraid that you will come after me with a hot towel and a and a, and a straight razor. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, and maybe like poltergeist, you know, like there could be some some there spirits around me. I don't know. I mean, it is. We are in October now. Yeah, absolutely. Getting, this is the the month of Halloween. So, uh, but yeah. No. To your point, you can't just make those connections or communicate when something is going awry. You have to make sure that you have those those proactive communications as well um, to make sure that you're checking in. Hey, how's everything going? Um, you know, make sure that you're, we, we, we do that too. I have to remind my team sometimes, put some time on your calendar, just check in, make sure that the vendor's feeling great. Make sure that you're the partners that you're working with are, are doing well and they'll be pleasantly surprised that you check in or they'll say, Hey, I've got a lot of meetings going on, but I, and I appreciate you. I will let you know, Next right. time I need you. But they need um, care. And, and believe me, I am not one who uses that term care frequently, you know, or the like. Uh, but that whole reaching out, even if it is a you're bothering me, go away. It's still a why are you bothering me? Because you're checking in. And, and the only the only caveat to that is don't check in to make a sale. Don't check in with an offer. Don't check in. Just check in. How are you doing? You know, yeah. if, you, if you check in with, I wanted to let you know what we're doing. That's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, it works the opposite. Then it's a sales call. Yeah. Leverage it, those check-ins for educational moments yeah. or, or things that are going on. Uh, maybe events that you have planned, Bob. I'm sure you, Simplex IT has events all the time. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and for the most part, we haven't been caught yet. <laughs> So no, it, it, for for example, every year we rent out a uh, video arcade, which doesn't have Lender, Le, Legend of Zelda. Oh no, arcade bar. We uh, rent that it still out. Sounds like a lot of fun. And we usually have about eighty or ninety people who show up and just play video games and eat bad bar appetizer food and drinks and all that kind of fun stuff. And it's great. And we look for other types of opportunities to do on that because we want to build that relationship. We want to build that you know environment and all that kind of fun stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you also get, you get your, you get clients that are customers that are meeting each other and, you know, building, building connections, maybe other business opportunities that are happening, Absolutely. Uh, you know, from those connections and that in itself is an ecosystem, right? Now you are reciprocating by providing a, a platform, an opportunity for your businesses to meet each other and to be able to create other 
bountiful, fruitful business opportunities. And that's actually one of the things we're starting to put together for ourselves is we're actually looking to go out to our clients and say, how can we do more of that? How can we do more? Because what I don't want to do is I don't want to do this. I don't want to a ask my clients to, or vice versa. This is this is to my bring, direction to bring opportunities, right? right? But I do want to, if there's a way that we can bring some of your messaging to our audience, or vice versa. How do we do that in a way that's not going to be over the top? Uh, you, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to subject my clients to incessant advertising for life. But I am willing to to share posts that are educational about what you do through our social media channels. And I'll, I'm interested to see, we just started doing this about a month or so ago. And I'll be interested to see how that goes. Because I think there's there may be some good opportunities both to increase the value of the relationships we've already got, but yes. also take advantage of those to move forward into other relationships. Be interesting to see how that works out. So I do have one final question for you. So this is... If you made three recommendations to a company that is looking to start to either assess or build these types of relationships or the like, what would those three things be? Not necessarily an MSP. All right. Well, my my first recommendation would be that you, to build that rapport, go out there and meet, meet the businesses. When I was a business banker, I used to, I used to go and I used to walk around and and visit the businesses and, and bring things, find opportunities to connect, you know, even outside of business hours where I wasn't a bother. Right. But I was trying to find a way to have a, uh, like a natural connection with somebody. Right. And, and I think that that's kind of the first step is, is, getting in the door and figuring out, okay, what's the value that, that I can bring to the table to help you. And what's the, what's, what's the reciprocal value, right. That you're looking to get out of, um, you know, out of each other essentially. Right. Um, I think I'm going to do this part again. Okay. I'm going to redo that. Um, Three recommendations for creating relationships. Hold on. I've got I've got some things in my brain. I'm just trying to think of a way to articulate it that makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, and then, sorry, we've got like two ideas and then rec- third recommendation for creating an impactful relationship for businesses is, um, Okay. All right. I got it. Okay. So three ideas to start creating those, those relationships with businesses. Yes. So three recommendations. The first recommendation would be get to know the people behind the business. We're all just, (laughs) we're all people at the end of the day, right? Get to know, get to know the, the, the people that are, that are actually, you know, bringing this, going in and working and and in this business and are invested in this business, and just understand that you are solving for hopefully with a new partnership, you're solving for pain points besides profitability. So make sure to to dig in deeper than just the the first why. Why would this partnership make sense? You know, there's the five whys analysis. Of, you ask why five times. And, and that's by the fifth why you get to the root cause of, of, you know, essentially what is the, what is the root cause or what's the root value that you can bring to that partnership? Um, so get to know the people, find out what is the, what is the true value that, that you can bring to the, to the table together. And then lastly, I would say, just follow up, just follow up, make sure that you're executing on that plan and let 
your partner know, your business partner know that you are executing on that plan. I think as a managed service provider, sometimes no news is good news is something that you may hear, right? But at the same time, it goes back to what we've been discussing. You want to make sure that you're getting back in front of that business to let them know what they're doing. Hey, just checking in. That's super important. So those are my three takeaways. So all three of those involve human to human level of interactions. Isn't there any other way we can do this? Because, you know, people. No? People are, I mean, smoke signals, um, them. technology, yes. Use technology. Yes. Blast emails. What could possibly go wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but to your point, it absolutely is critical because one of the biggest challenges, and people have asked me, you know, uh, what is it that keeps me up at night and the like, which I, for the most part, I hate that question because it's, it's kind of hackneyed. Uh, but I've always said, and I've said this for, you know, 17 years or so is is commoditization you know the worst thing to sell the worst thing to support the worst thing is a commodity because it's all about the money if that's the case and one of the best ways you can ensure that your organization is is a non-commodity is to create a human relationship and a human interaction you know yeah. as long as you're giving it the proper priority and the proper uh uh focus like what you're talking about yeah, it's there's so many parallels too between working as a as a vendor working with managed service providers and managed service providers working with with small to medium sized businesses yeah. and the fact that like when when I even when I was a business banker we would have these networking events where we'd bring people in and we would business owners and we would talk about exit strategies what's your exit strategy mm -hmm. right and like how do you because um, as a managed service provider, you're working with the entire employee base, but at the same time, it's a different audience, perhaps maybe than the CEO or the business owner, right? Where you're having different, more maybe more strategic conversations, right? As a as a managed service provider, and saying, okay, so what's the what's the plan? How can I help you to get there? Yeah. So yeah. again, like you said, it goes beyond the ROI. It goes to. Yep. And, and it, what's your life plan? What's your business life plan? <laughs> yeah, but, but it's different depending upon the role of the person you're talking to. Yes, it is. And and for you to be able to, to I hate to say customize, that sounds like it's, a, you know, you're, you're adding pieces or taking pieces away. But for you to be able to focus on what's important to that individual, that definitely helps you to move forward with that. And they sound like human soft skills, which is, you know, not. Oh, it's my, so important. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> It's like another human. Well, that. especially with especially with Gen Zs, I, I tell you, it's a you know, it's a whole other it's a whole other world. They'd rather text than no, absolutely, than get on, than get on the phone on a phone call. But and, and I, here's the thing, and, and and I'm not a Gen Z basher. I, I think every generation always gets bashed by the older people that they're they're always the this, they're always the that, and it's one of those where they were raised in technology totally. Yeah. Re formatted and restructured how connecting people i remember when i was a, a kid or just getting started in business people would talk about how oh, people just do everything on the phone why don't people visit anymore because we have the phone and now we're basically why don't people call anymore why is everything texting for the love of pete you know? <laughs> So stick with the times and know your audience, whether that's the the business owner or whoever yeah. that role is, but also from a, a generational standpoint. Absolutely. Yeah. And just adapt. We're all looking for the same thing. Just a question of how we how we choose to communicate it. Oh, and one more thing. Get off my lawn. <laughs> so, Vicki, I, I want to find myself you. saying that now. More Absolutely. Than I used to. Absolutely. And do they? No. No, they never do. I'm usually talking to the squirrels. I was just going to really. say stupid chipmunks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Vicki, thank you very, very much for doing this. Uh, obviously, Absolutely. you lost a bet in order for you to show up here. But uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to wants to connect with you, how do they do so? You can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Victoria Bruns. And I, I work at ConnectWise again, so you'll see I've got a nice ConnectWise LinkedIn banner on my yep. on my profile page. If you have any questions at all about what we talked about today, if you have questions about ConnectWise, 
ecosystems, marketplaces, all the like, please reach out to me. I love connecting with other people. And, and by the way, just to everybody else, there is a hidden uh, trap or, or, or Easter egg or whatever in the original Legend of Zelda that if you like, subscribe, or comment on this podcast, Zelda will actually be upgraded to Zelda Jr., uh, who has the Ocarina of Despair, which is basically a recording of my dating life. So, oh, wow. yeah, it, it is exciting. So make sure you like and subscribe and comment on this and share this. I You, you don't want to miss it, folks. I'm, I'm going to do the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everybody, for paying attention and catch you all next time. Bye. See ya.